Katie lives in a small town where certain people always keep up with the latest gossip. There's Margot, the vicar of St Mary's, Chris, the landlord of the King's Arms, Angelina, the receptionist at the doctor's surgery, and Shumash, the managing partner of Krish Estate Agency. If there's an interesting new person in town, or somebody's leaving, or having a baby, or having a family problem, these are the people who always know about it. Fortunately, Shumash is going out with Katie's mum, and so she hears the most interesting news pretty fast too. And then, if it's really interesting, she tells it to Katie. And so, one evening, when they were in the kitchen eating witch's broth, she said to Katie, I had coffee with Shumash this morning, and he told me that there is a new witch in town. He helped her find her house. It's a really swish place up on the hill, apparently. Oh, said Katie, that's exciting. Shall we invite her over? Well, I tried to see her, said Mum. I dropped round at her so-called surgery of white witchcraft, but her secretary told me I had to make an appointment and pay money up front just to say hello. I didn't think that sounded very friendly, so I looked her up on my crystal ball and couldn't find her. In case you don't know, just about every witch in the world keeps a profile on the crystal ball network known as the Coven. It's a bit like Facebook, only it's been around for centuries and you have to be a witch and have a crystal ball to use it. Katie obviously knew this and so she said, How can she be a witch if she's not on the crystal ball? Mum shrugged and handed her a business card that read, Agrippina Crompton, White Witch. That's strange, said Katie. Nobody calls themselves a white witch these days. It sounds sort of yucky. I agree, said Mum. She's a fake witch, if you ask me. Katie held the card between her fingers. She could not feel any magical energy in it. Yes, she thought, this is an imposter witch. Of course, lots of people whisper that Katie's mum is a fake witch. She runs a magic shop, but ordinary people can't buy spectacular tricks there that would astonish their friends. Witches have learned the hard way that it's best to keep hush about their special powers. She sells products to the general public that are mildly magic. For instance, she has anti-wrinkle creams that actually work. Of course, if you are a real witch who is on the crystal ball, she can sell you no end of powerful stuff. But that sort of business is all done behind the scenes. It was rather annoying when a week or so later, Katie was coming out of Mr Old's history lesson and Isabel said to her, My mum's been to see a real witch. Not a fake one like your mum. She's truly powerful and can completely change your life for the better. If you mean Agrippina, what's her name, said Katie. She's the fake witch. My mum's the real one. But your mum can't tell the difference, so she's got them the wrong way round. I don't think so, said Isabel. And Samantha, who was Isabel's friend, walked behind Katie saying, Fake, fake, fake. But Isabel and Samantha were Katie's enemies. She expected them to be nasty. It was much more annoying when Katie called her friend Paul and learnt that he was actually working for the fake witch. He had just a little bit of wizardry in his blood and was always fascinated by magic. Now he was excited because he had a Saturday morning job with an actual witch. His first role was to push marketing literature through letterboxes. Some of this had already arrived at Katie's house. They included postcards with pictures of oceans, mountains and forests that were overwritten with commandments like be bold and free and love yourself and the whole secret of happiness is to think happy thoughts and each and every moment of each and every day, do exactly what you want. 
When Katie had first seen them, she thought, That makes life sound nice and simple. It's kind of the opposite of what they say at school. She could see how some people might pin these cards on the kitchen wall or on the back of the loo door to give them inspiration. And they could find contact details for Agrippina's surgery of white witchcraft on the back of the cards. After Paul had done a stint of handing out this psychic propaganda, he had been allowed to mix some potions and bottle them up. How can you do that? exclaimed Katie. No real witch would let you mix her potions. She's the complete fake and she's conning people and giving magic a bad name. But Paul laughed and said, you're just saying that because she's a rival to your mum and taking business off her. No, I'm not, said Katie. She's not even on the crystal ball. So what, said Paul. The crystal ball is old school. Agrippina would rather be on Facebook and Twitter. That's where the customers are. Later that day, Katie told her mum about Paul. Her mum looked quite angry behind the eyes. She took a deep breath and said, I know now for sure that Agrippina is a fake. How? asked Katie. She came into my shop. I did not feel any magical energy coming off her at all. In fact, Paul has more energy than she does. She came over and introduced herself. I laughed and said, Well, I ought to charge you fifty pounds for saying hello. She said, That's not very friendly. And I said, It's what your secretary told me when I came by your surgery. Then she apologised for the misunderstanding and tried to be nice. She had come to buy some things off me. She had a whole list. Alatris, Rude, Coltsford, Brimstone Powder, Hazel, Yarrow, all prepared with ready-made spell powder so that she would not have to do any magic of her own. I asked for her call sign on the crystal ball and when she admitted, as I knew anyway, that she wasn't a member of the coven, I told her that I could not serve her magical ingredients. She looked very put out and laughed in quite a huff. Great, said Katie with a laugh. I'm glad you sent her off with a flea in her ear. She just wants to use your magic. In fact, that's probably why she set up her office near your shop, so she can charge huge fees to her customers while buying spells off you for next to nothing. And then she remembered something. Did I tell you that Isabel's mum is a client of Agrippina and swears by her? Really? said Katie's mum. Yes, really, said Katie. That's a coincidence, said Katie's mum, because Shumash told me today that she's taking out a big new mortgage on her house. She came into his office to ask his advice. What does that mean? asked Katie. That she's borrowing loads of money hundreds of thousands of pounds. Katie's eyes opened wide. You don't think Agrippina is charging her that much? No, laughed her mum. It's probably just a coincidence. Agrippina's magic powers were in doubt, but she certainly had some slick marketing skills. On Saturday morning, Paul and some other young people hung around the town centre offering shoppers free personality tests. All they had to do was fill in a questionnaire about their lives and then they could have a free consultation with Agrippina. Most of them came away having bought Agrippina's book, The Magic Path to Happiness, Health and Inner Harmony. She spelt magic with a CK on the end, as most fake witches do, because it looks sort of ancient and occult. The book cost £15. If they bought a treatment, that cost a lot more. And if they booked another appointment, that was even more expensive. In fact, it seemed like Agrippina was everywhere. At school on Monday, Katie's friend Isis heard that a girl called Skye had gone to see Agrippina and asked her for a love spell to get her boyfriend back. There's a fat chance said Isis, because he told Samantha that Skye has bad breath. 
and now he's going bowling with Samantha on Friday. <laughs> Trust Samantha to steal somebody's boyfriend, said Katie. Do you know how much Sky paid Agrippina for the fake spell? I don't know, said Isis, but her dad's really rich. He's a plumber and Mum says he charges a fortune just to turn up with his tools. A few days later, Margot the vicar came into the magic shop and asked if she could speak to Katie's mum in private. Katie's mum closed the shop, put on the kettle and got her best biscuits out of the tin. The Reverend Margot said, Have you come across a witch called Agrippina Crompton? Yes, unfortunately, said Katie's mum, but I have nothing to do with her. I'm glad to hear that said Margot. I'm very concerned about her. One of my parishioners claims she is conning his elderly mother out of all her money. Really? exclaimed Katie's mum. Well, I'm not entirely surprised. I, I knew she was a fake as soon as I met her. Margot and Katie's mum agreed to keep an eye on the suspicious newcomer. When Katie came home, she had more news. Isabel and her family had moved out of their large and lovely house and into a tiny flat. Isabel was pretty unhappy about it. All she would say was that her mum had made a big mistake with money. Well, 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 said Katie's mum. I strongly suspect that this has something to do with Agrippina. But how can we find out? That was something that Katie began to ponder. And that was the first part of our story, Katie and the Other Witch. It seems like Agrippina is a ruthless con artist who is giving honest witches a bad name. What do you think Katie and her mum can do to stop her? By the way, did you know that Agrippina was a Roman name? For instance, the Empress Agrippina was the wife of the Emperor Claudius, and some people say that she poisoned him. Her son was the Emperor Nero, who famously played his violin while Rome burned. The other witch is a lady called Agrippina Crompton, who Katie and her mum know is a fake. It seems that she is charging people loads of money for fake spells. How can Katie prove that she is a con artist? When Katie has some interesting news, she always shares it with her best friend, who is called Isis. It was only natural that she told her all about the fake witch and how she had conned Isabel's mum out of all her money. Poor Isabel texted back Isis on the chat app. I mean, she's a bit of a... She was going to call her something rude, perhaps a farm animal, but she was too well brought up, so she just wrote three dots. Then she added, But it's totally wrong to cheat people. What we need now, replied Katie, is proof. Isis thought about the problem all evening, and the next day at school she said to Katie, I've got a plan to nail that fake witch, and it's pure genius. This weekend, I will fill in one of those silly personality tests. I'll get a free appointment with Agrippina, tell her that I've lost my beloved boyfriend, cry a bit, and let her know that I'm very rich and spoiled, and my mum will pay any price to make me happy. Let's see what she comes up with. It was such a brilliant idea that Katie and Isis slapped hands together and Isis was as good as her word. Instead of going to the pony farm on Saturday morning, she walked past the shopping centre and met Paul. Hi Isis, said Paul. Do you want to fill in a free personality test? Why should I? said Isis, not looking very interested. It can only say that I have star quality. Oh, it can help you in all sorts of ways, said Paul. Everyone says it's worthwhile, and it only takes five minutes. And so Isis filled in the test, answering seemingly pointless questions like, 
Do you browse through railway timetables, directories or dictionaries just for pleasure? Do you enjoy telling people the latest scandals about your circle? Would you rather be an astronaut or a dustman? Do you make tactless remarks at parties? When she had completed the questionnaire, Paul tapped on his iPad and booked Isis in for a free appointment at 4.30 that afternoon. The witch's office was in a large terraced house along with some lawyers, accountants and a taxi company. Isis looked around the room. Well, you've got to hand it to Agrippina, she thought to herself. The fake witch has a cool, witchy style. Everything was minimalist and very high quality. The floor was solid oak. The subdued lighting came from side lamps and some small spotlights in the ceiling. Behind the receptionist's desk hung two enormous tribal masks, triangular faces with orange and white face paint and dried grass for hair. They were extremely striking. A couple of statues about waist height were more grotesque, with horrid faces and carved monkeys sitting on their heads. The whole effect was of a very upmarket tribal art gallery in somewhere like Mayfair. After a little while, the receptionist said, You may go in now. Agrippina was looking out of the window towards the park. She turned around and said, Come in, Isis. Sit down and make yourself comfortable. Isis settled down on a sofa and Agrippina sat on an office chair behind a table. The faker wore a smart professional suit and her hair looked like it had been expensively done. Gold bangles dangled around her wrists. You might have taken her for a businesswoman. Isis thought, if Katie's mum smartened herself up like that, she might get more customers. Agrippina looked through her notes with a serious expression on her face. Well, I don't mean to alarm you, she said, but I have read your test results and I'm very concerned about your personality. You really don't love yourself. Do you, Isis? Should I? replied Isis. Yes, you should, said Agrippina. Loving yourself is the first step to health, wealth and happiness. At which point Isis began to sob and say, How, how can I love myself when nobody else does? My boyfriend dumped me and my mum never wants to spend time with me. She's far too busy shopping and going on luxury holidays. She thinks... All she has to do is throw money at me to make me happy. But love means nothing to her. When my dad divorced her, he gave her millions and millions of pounds. And now she thinks money is the solution to everything. Oh dear, said Agrippina, that is sad. But all is not lost. If you come and see me twice a week, I'm sure I can help you find yourself. What can you do? asked Isis. Well... I always say it is important to treat the whole family, said Agrippina. It seems that your mother's emphasis on money and material things is the cause of your unhappiness. Yes, I can see this coming through in your test results. So what we need to do is for me to meet your mother and to suggest that she makes a little sacrifice. Ugh, what kind of sacrifice? asked Isis. Do you mean like killing a chicken on an altar? I saw that in a film about vampires. Oh, goodness gracious, no, exclaimed Agrippina. We don't do horrid things like that these days. I mean, well, you'll see. More of a financial sacrifice to prove that love is more important than money. Oh, I see, said Isis. That makes sense. Well, I'll ask her if she'll come and see you. Isis stood up, looking very serious, and left the room. It was only when she met Katie outside on the pavement and they had walked around the corner that she burst out laughing. <gasps> I did my poor little rich girl act and she bought it a hundred percent. You could have seen her eyes light up when I told her that my mum is filthy rich. She was planning so many greedy deeds that she could hardly stop herself drooling all over her designer suit. For the next stage of the plan they needed the help of Isis's mum. Katie's mum rang her up and explained what they wanted her to do. 
Oh, I don't know, said Isis's mum. I never was any good at acting. And what if anyone heard that I was consulting a witch? I am sorry, Doreen. I don't mean any offence, but it's not the done thing round here. But Margot the vicar was more persuasive. Isis's mum agreed to help her after she had spoken to the reverend. In fact, it turned out that she was very good at playing the part of a woman who had loads and loads of money, so much that she could not find enough time for all the luxury cruises, safaris and health spa treatments that she wanted to buy. Secretly, it was a bit of a fantasy of hers. She also had to pretend to be gullible. She made an appointment with the witch. Agrippina told her how concerned she was about her daughter, as she did not love herself enough, as she put too much store by her schoolwork, and as a consequence was destined to be unhappy. "'I've always taught her to love herself above all else!' exclaimed Isis's mum, which of course was not true. "'In fact, I teach her to worship herself like a god!' "'That's very good,' said Agrippina. "'We all have the divine within us, but clearly something is not working. "'I hope you don't mind me saying this, but perhaps she puts too much emphasis on material things, "'like luxury and money. "'This is where I can help you. "'To treat Isis, we need to treat the whole family. "'I'm afraid it will be expensive.' but you only want the best for your Isis. Oh, indeed, the best of everything, said her mother. The most powerful magic comes from Irian Jaya. I have exclusive access to an ancient money tree that grows in a remote Indonesian village. You must make a sacrifice, and my porters will carry it to the tree and hang it on the branches. What kind of sacrifice? asked Isis's mum. Hmm... I would suggest about a hundred thousand to begin with, and if that does not fully work, we can always step up the dose. A hundred thousand what? Pounds, said Agrippina, gravely. In weight? No, money. When Isis's mum left the office, she couldn't wait to listen back to the secret recording to make sure that she'd heard correctly. She sat in the car with Katie's mum and Margot and pressed the play button. Yes, Agrippina really had suggested that she sacrifice a hundred thousand pounds in money so that it could be hung on the branches of a magic tree in the Indonesian jungle. Could anyone be so stupid as to fall for that? she asked. I think Isabel's mum did, said Katie's mum. They were tempted to go straight to the police with the evidence, but they wondered why Isabel's mum and Margot's parishioner had not done that themselves. I have spoken to both of them, said Margot, and they are too embarrassed to admit how foolish they have been. I can understand that, said Isis's mum. I heard that Isabel wanted to win a TV talent show and Agrippina persuaded her to hand over all her money to make it possible, but then Isabel didn't even make it past the first audition. That's awful! said Katie's mum. We must stop her. They dropped Margot off at the church and Katie's mum said to Isis's mum, have you got time for coffee? They decided to go back to Katie's house because they could talk more privately than in a coffee shop. And that's how they planned what to do next. Isis's mum was cast in the starring role of the plot. But the main thing she had to do was not to be scared whatever happened. We're just going to spook her, said Katie's mum. Nobody can get hurt. Two days later, Isis and her mother were back in the reception room of Agrippina's white witch surgery. Another client, a middle-aged woman with pearls, was sitting on the sofa opposite them. Suddenly she said, Oh, and then, dear me, did you see that? It gave me a fright. The receptionist looked over and said softly, Excuse me, madam. Is anything the matter? Ah, uh, she said, still a little flustered. It's just that the mask on the wall winked at me. I wasn't expecting it. Surely not, said the receptionist. Isis piped up. Anything can happen here. It's a witch's surgery. The lady reddened a little and said, Hmm, I suppose I must have imagined it. A little later, the receptionist said, 
I hope you are feeling all right now, Mrs Crawford. Agrippina is ready to see you. Mrs Crawford's consultation with Agrippina did not last much more than about ten minutes. She came out looking more confused than ever. The receptionist asked, Would you like to book another appointment? Er, uh, no, thank you, said the lady. Then she turned to Isis's mum and said in a low voice, That was the strangest conversation of my life. She confessed to being a fake witch, a cold-hearted con artist, and trying to fleece me of all my savings. When she had gone, Agrippina came out of her office looking rather pale and shocked. She walked over to Isis and her mum and said, I am very sorry. I am going to have to reschedule your appointment. I am not quite myself today. Is that because you are telling the truth? asked Isis. Well, yes, actually, said Agrippina. It's not like me at all. I can't understand why I keep doing it. Poor you, said Isis's mum sympathetically. It must be most embarrassing. Well, it is rather, said Agrippina. Especially as you are a con artist, added Isis. That's right, agreed Agrippina. She looked startled at her own words and added, Oh my God, why do I keep doing that? It was then that one of the giant masks on the wall explained in a deep, scary voice, Because you are a fake witch who has been bewitched by a real one. The receptionist stood up and looked around at the mask. It said to her, And you are guilty too, because you knew exactly what she's up to. The receptionist screamed and accidentally knocked over a vase of flowers. Then a mask, shaped like a fruit bat, flew off the wall and started to buzz around her hair. Ah, oh, get off me, said the receptionist, waving her arms at it and making for the door. Agrippina spoke in a cracked voice. Are you witches? Isis stood up and waved her finger at her. If you were a real witch, you would know we aren't she said, but this is the work of a real witch, and if you don't want to be haunted by wooden statues for the rest of your life, you had better give back all the money that you have stolen. But I can't. I've spent most of it, complained the fake witch, now looking very alarmed. One of the more gruesome wooden statues with monkeys' heads on it started to walk towards her. It said, Sell your house, sell your car, sell your works of art. Pay back the people you tricked. Agrippina cowered behind the sofa while the masks joined in saying, Pay them back, pay them back. You're lucky we haven't gone to the police, said Isis, but we will do if you don't repay the people you cruelly tricked. All right, all right, I will, shrieked Agrippina from behind the sofa. And Isis and her mum knew she really meant what she said because Katie's mum had put a truth spell on her. Their work was done, and they left Agrippina and the talking statues to get on with the rest of their day. Of course, the news travelled fast around town that the other witch was closing her surgery and selling up her house. There were rumours that Katie's mum had put a spell on her. Some people said that the rival witches had battled it out with magic wands and flying broomsticks over the common at midnight on Friday the 13th. It was all nonsense, of course. The truth was even stranger, and the gossip took a more positive tone. Shumash reported that Isabel's mum seemed to have got over her financial troubles, because she was able to move back into her old house. The vicar said that her parishioner was happy that his mother had got her money back. As for Katie's mum, she was used to rumours and gossip. It was part and parcel of being a witch. But she had the satisfaction of knowing that she always used her powers responsibly and to help people. Not herself, because, as she always said to Katie, real magic is the opposite of selfishness. It's about understanding other people's feelings. <laughs>